Chef and culinary director for Conflict Kitchen, uh, which has been operating here in Pittsburgh for about three years. Uh, I'm going to give just kind of an overview of the project and then kind of a little more specifics on our process and some of the events and uh, different projects that we work on as well. Um, but just to go back to the beginnings of the project, um, Conflict Kitchen was originally started out of a, a project um, <clears throat> that John Rubin and Don Waleski started uh, as artists at Carnegie Mellon University. And they used the spot, which is now Livermore, actually. But um, at the time, they were running a, a project called the Store, Storefront Project, where they were opening um, art projects for just one semester at a time uh, in abandoned or unused storefronts in the city. And at that time, East Liberty was still predominantly unfilled, a lot of the spaces. And they um, opened what was, they called the Waffle Shop uh, in the corner space. And then they had this other storefront uh, in the back that they didn't have a, a plan with what to do with that space. So they were talking about you know, different things that they'd like to see in Pittsburgh and what they thought Pittsburgh was lacking. Uh, and some of that was you know, diversity, not just ethnically within the city, but also within the food scene. And they were talking about foods they'd like to see in Pittsburgh and it kind of listing off a few things and it clicked that a lot of the countries they were naming were not only foods that you couldn't find in Pittsburgh, but also foods from countries with which the United States had some sort of conflict. And so they decided to make that the theme of the restaurant and to um, convert the space and we did kind of just actually like a hanging uh, convertible um, temporary structure on the outside of the door and created a conflict kitchen which opened in East Liberty. Um, so the <clears throat> space there we would, um, all the images and the colors and the, the name of the restaurant, everything is done um, with you know, a process in mind where we develop images and patterns and color schemes. And, uh, and in this case, we're using Farsi for the Iranian version of the kitchens. So, um, so that was the first thing they opened with was Iranian. Uh, did a Kubide kitchen and at this location it was a, a smaller staff and shorter hours and they did basically just a, a very small menu of some takeout street food items. It was just a walk-up window. People would come and get you know, basically a, a wrap sandwich or uh, something along those lines. But with the food, uh, they would not just get the food from those countries. They would also get the food wrapped in uh, this wrapper here, which is something that we do with each iteration. And so before we start the <clears throat> whole process of developing the menu and the food, we also um, do interviews with people living in that country as well as uh, people from that country that are living here in Pittsburgh. And we just kind of touch on it, you know, just a wide variety of subjects about life in that country, about you know, their views of the US, their views of their own government, their own culture, the history of the country, the food culture of the country. And, with, and we're not even looking for one specific viewpoint. We purposely try and find different viewpoints that may um, disagree with each other within the same publication. And so in that location, we did uh, you know, a number of different iterations. So every few months, we'll actually s s close down and reopen the next day as a different restaurant featuring a different country, a different cuisine, different information. Uh, and so in that first location we did uh, Iranian, Afghani, and Venezuelan. And you can see kind of a closer look up here of the, of the wrappers that the foods are in and it's broken down into subject matter headings. So then we'll have people, to, you know, this is uh, the Afghani wrapper and the headings would be culture, the US presence in Afghanistan, family, dating and marriage, education, ethnic identity, and so we try and get different viewpoints on all these subject matters that come up through our conversations uh, with the people from those countries and they include those in the publications that we put out. And so we had discovered that by using food, people are much more likely to, to read the publication and engage 
with us in a dialogue as well. By, if you just stand on the street corner handing out pamphlets, most people will either take it and throw it away or just walk by. People aren't invested in it. And if you get them to come to the restaurant and their food is an easier way to approach culture uh, and different uh, <clears throat> you know, political conversations, I think people are comfortable with food and bring that into life. And then once they've committed to getting the food and they've been talking to you at the window for a little bit, you can give them some information and they're more likely to digest it, to read it, to, to engage with it a little bit more. And so here's some images of our employees. And this is at the previous location, but we do this in our new location. So we try and stimulate conversation among our guests as much as we can. Um, we don't try and act as experts or to be handing you know, just down like facts and information. We try and just promote a conversation amongst the guests themselves and, and with us as well about what they know about these countries, what they know about the people of these countries. And so the, here's uh, some images of the, the Afghani version that we did, and which we're actually going to be revisiting shortly. Starting in March, we're going to actually be bringing back the Afghan version again. Um, so at the previous location, we just did the Bolani Patsi, which are uh, kind of a savory turnover, which is a common street food in Afghanistan. And that will be on the new menu next month, but we have a much fuller menu and a much bigger kitchen now, so we're able to kind of fill out the rest of the menu with a lot more items. And in that location, we also did our first uh, Venezuelan version of the, of the project. Um, and this is right about when I came onto the project. I was hired uh, to come into the kitchen. We hadn't had a full-time chef before. It was kind of, they were starting up and getting the project up and running. And then I came on, and then we, from that point on, we developed kind of fuller menus and uh, we started looking for a location that would suit our needs a little better as far as having more space and more opportunity to engage with people. So the first menu that uh, I helped create with the, the project was the Cuban menu, which we saw as kind of a natural transition from Venezuela, which at the time was led by Hugo Chavez, who was very close with the Castro regimes in Cuba. So we decided, uh, for the first time, we were able to, to, to go to the country together. And from that point on, we've been doing that for each country we've done. So now we've went to the first one we did, though, is we went to Cuba, and we did uh, all the interviews there in person, uh, we had ranged some ahead of time, but a lot of the best stuff we got were people that we would just meet on the street or in a restaurant or a bar or uh, taxi drivers, you know, had, had great information for us. And then along with the interviews that we're conducting, um, we also, was mostly my role is to do a lot of the food research. So we go to the markets uh, and then we spend a few days each time with people from those countries who invite us into their home, or in, in Cuba, I was able to, to spend one day cooking in a home with a family and another day cooking in a restaurant. Um, so here's some images of that, where I was cooking, basically we prepared um, kind of almost like a, a large party type meal, like a big kind of picnic-y type thing where we um, had beans and pork and rice and um, lots of different dishes that we prepared there with them and then invited the whole building that they lived in to come down and eat with us. And at the menu from that meal became almost exactly the menu that we opened in Pittsburgh for the, the Cuban version. And we were able to interview, you know, some, this is uh, some young people that we met. Um, just, she was our waitress the previous night in a restaurant and then she invited us to meet some of her friends, some young people at a bar the next day. Um, we also, you know, like I said, the taxi drivers have lots of good, you know, stories to tell and information. And the interesting thing about Cuba was that they have this kind of inverted social pyramid now, where socioeconomic pyramid, where um, doctors and lawyers and like are the same as every other profession, where they get paid the same amount by the state. Like there's basically a flat salary for all jobs which go through the state, which is the equivalent of about twenty dollars a month, um, and then. People who work in the tourism industry are, have access to the base, this convertible currency that's tied to the dollar. And that when you're there as a tourist, you, you'll pay in this convertible currency for taxis, for restaurant meals, for hotels. And so then the, it ends up being that the people who work in tourism are the, are the wealthiest people in the country. I mean, you can make a month's wages in a night's tip at a restaurant. And so it kind of, some of the, the stories we were heard was the frustration of, 
you know, the, they were incredibly educated population, and like half the people driving the taxis that we talked to were computer scientists or psychologists or doctors or lawyers or professors, but then in order to be able to succeed economically, they would take up another job in the, in the tourism industry where they'd be driving a taxi or being a bellhop. And so we brought that menu back uh, to Pittsburgh, and that was the last one we opened at our East Liberty location. And at that location, too, we started doing a series of events. Um, so this is one of our most popular events that we've done uh, two or three times now with uh, Iran, where we prepare food in Pittsburgh, and they prepare the exact same meal in Tehran. And then we have kind of a Skype dinner party live, where, as you can see, like up at the end of our table is the screen, and you can see the group that we're eating with in Tehran at that exact moment. And then in Tehran, they have the screen, and they see us. And then we have a conversation back and forth in real time about you know, life and the food we're eating and their thoughts on you know, living in Iran and what it's like day to day there. And we've done that a few different times. You can see the images here. And so there's some really interesting dialogue that comes out of these conversations, things that you don't necessarily think about touching upon that just develop through this natural conversation. And that's primarily what we're going through in the project, is to have create a dialogue between the people of the United States and the people of these countries whose cultures we may not be so familiar with. And so we're not there to discuss you know, our government's issue with their government, or you know, necessarily even the nature of the conflict between the two countries on a global scale. We're more to talk about just, like, what do we have in common? What you know, is the day-to-day -day life like of an Iranian person? What does an Iranian person, you know, how do they feel about their government or their, you know, social regime? Uh, we also did a project with the Afghani uh, filmmakers, um, a similar thing where we, we showed some uh, autobiographical films that they had produced, and then after the showing of the films, we did live conversation back and forth with the filmmakers as well, and people were able to discuss the films with them, and they were filming aspects of their day-to-day -day life in Afghanistan. Uh, we also did, at the previous location, we did Pittsburgh's first Persian cultural festival, which was uh, way more successful than we even imagined, as you can see. Um, and it was, you know, it's surprising, like, some of the times when we open these restaurants or these iterations of the project with different countries, um, we're, we're surprised by the, re the reaction to it where there is this kind of hidden population in Pittsburgh that will come out and will be incredibly supportive and very, you know, <clears throat> engaged with the project. And so at that uh, cultural event, we had, you know, um, f food, of course, and we had a live cooking show and a live talk show and the opportunity for anybody to engage with uh, some of the, the Persians here in Pittsburgh as well as to engage uh, with our audience in Tehran. Uh, we also occasionally bring in school, pro school groups to kind of um, do similar things where we try and get somebody in the country that we're dealing with to, to speak with uh, the school group directly. Um, another aspect of the project occasionally is we, the artists that started this project also run the, the billboard that you may be familiar with on Highland Avenue. So occasionally we put some of uh, the quotes from our project um, up on that <coughs> billboard as well to kind of get the information out there through another means. And so then, th the most recent um, iteration that we've done is North Korea. Um, and here's kind of an image of modern day North and South Korea. Um, and unfortunately, it is, you know, North Korea is not a country where it's easy to travel to as an American. Um, so we were not able to go to North Korea, but we did have a number of interactions with North Koreans. And the first one was actually in Cuba. Um, we were walking down the street in Havana, and we happened upon this building. And then we noticed that surrounding the building were all these images of um, the, the Kim regime and North Korean soldiers. And so then we were able to deduce it was the North Korean embassy for, in Cuba. And we rang the doorbell, and a guy walks, like a few minutes later, a guy walks out, and he totally blew our conception of North Koreans because he walked out wearing 
flip flops and like shorts and like a polo shirt and he came out and he was speaking fluent Spanish with us and was, you know, permitted us to have a short conversation with him about North Korea and, and food and what it's like living there, um, but was a little impatient with the questions and then kind of sent us on our way. Um, and then we've also had the opportunity, uh, one of the collaborators on the project, John Rubin, was in China and North Korea runs these kind of satellite promotional restaurants uh, in China, uh, around Asia, and I think there's actually one in Europe as well, where they bring in a whole staff of North Koreans and they put on these stage shows during the meal and they, they prepare North Korean food and then they do these like elaborate productions during the meal of what they want you to perceive as North Korean culture. Uh, when we were then we were able to conduct interviews with some North Koreans um, that are living in the United States. Most of that population is in Los Angeles, which has the largest Korean population in the US. Um, but the North Korean expatriate population is very small. There's only about 25,000 North Koreans outside of North Korea in the whole world, uh, most of which are in either China or, or South Korea at this point in time. So we were able to bring, you know, start developing the North Korean menu, and then we brought that to um, a large conference called Creative Time in New York City, in a setting very similar to this, actually. <laughs> And we did, you know, a large meal was the first version of um, North Korea that we presented where we had half of the table getting North Korean menu and half of the tables getting um, South Korean food. And then they were, uh, their placemats were all, you know, taken directly from the interviews that we conducted. And we conducted interviews f for this project with both South and North Koreans to get their view on each other as well as the perspective on Americans and that was one of the most interesting part of the, this version of, of the project, I think, was learning about the life of North Koreans in South Korea, which is actually very hard. They're not particularly welcomed there, and most of them actually try and pass as not being North Korean. And we heard multiple stories about people losing jobs when they was discovered they were North Korean, or people being shunned or you, you know, turned away from relationships. And, things like that. So life for North Koreans is, is, doesn't get much easier when they leave North Korea, unfortunately. Here's some more images of the events. And we also did this uh, same event uh, in San Francisco as well. And then, so we closed the East Liberty location. We had an agreement to move downtown. And then unfortunately that fell through. So for a while we were homeless and we opened what we called a paladar, which is uh, kind of a a version of a restaurant that's common in Cuba now where you can find it's like the first kind of <clears throat> steps into free market economy in Cuba where they, the state has allowed these very small in-home restaurants to open up and they're privately run and they're owned by the people who own the houses. And you walk in and, and it's, once you're inside, it doesn't look like you're in somebody's house anymore. It's like set up like a very small restaurant. Uh, and you won't notice necessarily that you're in a home until you say you have to go to the bathroom and you walk down a hallway past the bedroom or something like that. But these are actually now the best restaurants in all of Cuba, are these privately run restaurants that are in these small homes. So we decided to kind of replicate that here in Pittsburgh uh, when, while we were without a home. And so we did a series of in-home five course meals, um, which actually was a, something that we we're looking to maybe revive again pretty soon because it's a really nice setting of having a group of 12 people at a time sit down for a five course meal and be able to have open discussions about the politics of Cuba and what life is like in Cuba and touching on, you know, a far wider ranging discussion than you can have just at a takeout window. But then we were lucky enough in April to find their new location, which now we're located in Shemley Plaza in Oakland. Um, and so it is, we're like one of the kiosks there, but it does have a much larger, fuller kitchen and we're able to do a lot more than we were able to do previously. And the new location has also allowed us to reach, uh, in the warm months, two to 300 people a day, where previously we were only reaching, you know, 30 to 50 people possibly a day. So now um, we're located, you know, in Shenley Plaza, which is nice because it's right in between the two universities, as well as right by the museums, the main library, and, you know, the conservatory, a lot of cultural institutions that are drawing people um, from around the region to that area. So we're reading, reaching a lot more people now that are just happening upon us. Uh, whereas previously in East Liberty was people that were deliberately coming to see us, which 
is great and we love the support, but it, part of the mission of the project is to expose the cultures and the foods of these, of these countries to people who may not have been familiar with them or have even been seeking them out. Um, so we opened uh, the new location with uh, Cuba and we've also done Iran. Um, but we've also been able to do some more programming in this location. Um, so we did this one uh, project called The Foreigner, where we have one of our employees here, Elise, and then one of our collaborators in Tehran, both get mic'd up, put on headphones, and you're able to, to go order your food at the window, and then when you order your food, one of our employees will say, hey, would you like to have lunch with an Iranian today? And if you say yes, they'll say, oh, this is Elise, she's an Iranian today, she's around the corner. And you sit down, and when you talk to Elise, you're actually talking to Sorab in Tehran. So she's wearing the, the microphone, and you hear, she, you know, that goes, the sound goes through, and then Sorab hears it in, in Tehran, and he speaks, and she only speaks what he says. So she's basically just a human avatar for Sorab in Tehran. So you can sit down and have a real-time meal with somebody in Iran and have a conversation with them. And this has been a, a pretty successful project, and it's been really nice. And unfortunately, some of the countries we do with have, it's more practical to do that type of thing than others. You know, with Cuba, we were not able to really do that type of thing because of the lack of internet access. Whereas Iran, which is something most people don't know, actually has relatively open and widely used accessible internet. Um, we also started doing something called the, the blank country speech. So in this case, it's the Iranian speech. So what we do is we speak to a lot of Iranians both in Pittsburgh and in Iran, and we have them write a speech or a segment of a speech that they would like to hear President Obama deliver. So it's kind of saying like their dream speech for the President of the United States, touching upon the issues with their own country. And then we compile it and we publish it both as a newspaper, um, and we also hire an Obama impersonator. <laughs> and we put a presidential podium in the middle of Shenley Plaza, and he delivers this speech, and it's like really interesting to watch this happen because like a lot of the people walking around there are like you know 18 year old college kids, and they're like, I mean, I like literally have heard people walk by and be like, is that Obama? Like, I thought there'd be more security, and like <laughs> he's just standing there in the middle of the field, um, and he doesn't even. I mean, he looks a decent amount like Obama, but not that much like Obama. Um, but then with, now with the most recent one, while we've been under bad weather, we've, uh, we did another version of this, which you can find linked to at our website, um, where we did um, with Cubans, and we were actually able to hire the world's premier Obama impersonator who will read any speech you send him from his little Oval Office studio and film it. And so we have like a live Oval Office address that's filmed, and we made a video of it that's available on our website that's... Uh, the Cuban speech, which we also have copies of as a newspaper in the, project, in the shop now. Um, so it's, here's the most recent image of the project. Uh, we are now North Korean, and so we look very North Korean, which is fitting particularly this time of year where it's all gray and sludgy out anyway, and then you have this kind of stark concrete building. Um, with uh, the <clears throat> So the images across the, the side of the building there are, all, are actually the menu items uh, written in Korean, and then we have... Uh, full North Korean menu available now, and uh, like I said, in March we'll be switching to Afghanistan. Uh, again, we'll be re revisiting that, and then in June we're traveling to Palestine uh, to conduct the interviews and do the cooking uh, in homes in Palestine, and that'll be the newest uh, iteration that we open up uh, probably towards the end of the summer into fall.